So your alpha helix, this is what it looks like. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to point out a couple of things. First, we've got our amino terminus up here, our carboxy terminus down here. We've got a couple of atoms that I want you to recognize. So we've got this blue sphere or blue ball, that's going to be our nitrogen. That's our amino termini. Then we've got this guy, which is an alpha carbon. Therefore, this purple atom, this purple ball is going to be your R group. So think purple ball is your R group. So we've got our alpha carbon, then our carboxy carbon. Then we've got another uh, N termini, alpha carbon, carboxy termini. This is important to kind of give yourself some orientation about what groups are involved. Now, the one that I kind of breezed over was this red ball, this red sphere. That is going to be an oxygen, specifically the carbonyl double bonded oxygen. So what we have are all of these atoms that are put together to make this larger but local structure, this alpha helix. Now, the helical backbone is held together by hydrogen bonds between the backbone amides of an N and N plus four amino acids. Okay, so it is a right-handed helix with a 3.6 residues per turn. So when you think about that, think about it as you're starting in the 12 o'clock position and then that peptide bond is going to wrap around, and when it gets back to that 12 o'clock position, it's gonna take approximately 3.6 residues for that turn. Now, the height of that, this is also known as the pitch, the height of that is going to be 5.4 angstroms. So rotation is, well, from one point to the next point to make a full rotation, it's 3.6 amino acids, and it's 5.4 angstroms tall. Your peptide bonds are aligned roughly parallel to the alpha or to the helical axis, and side chains point out. That's one important point about the alpha helix, and you can kind of see that. It's easier to see on the ones that are are at these that are not in the foreground or background, but these purple spheres they are pointed outward from the helix. So side chains or R groups point out and are perpendicular to the helical axis. Now, one question that we, we just kind of breezed over a little bit was an alpha or an alpha helix is a right-handed helix. And so when you think about that, the what people generally do is they'll say, well, look at your thumb and how it folds in. So it's going to be rotating toward, rotating toward your thumb. And so then it's going to coil upward. Um, and that constitutes a right-handed helix compared to a left-handed helix. Um, so a couple of different depictions of this. Well, we've got the one that we just saw right here. I kind of pointed out all the different atoms in that. This is a top-down view. This is a side angle or a side view. However, one of the things that's different is we have space-filling atoms. So all of the atoms, well, we don't have any space between those individual atoms. We're not really seeing those bonds. Then this guy right here, uh, figure D, that is also the top-down view, but all that we're looking at is the atoms of the polypeptide. So we're not looking at peptide. Or no, I'm sorry, we're... Um, what we are looking at here is the amino acids. So essentially think, of, yeah, so number one here, that's your um, your first amino acid, two is your second, three is your third, and four is your fourth amino acid. So the one is your positively charged nitrogen, and then number four, that's going to be contributing your negatively charged oxygen or partially negatively charged oxygen so that you can establish that hydrogen bond between those two um, residues. Now the alpha helix, the top view of an alpha helix, the inner diameter of that helix, so without any side chains, is four to five angstroms. So basically nothing can fit inside of this. So if you think about a uh, carboxylic acid or something like that, that, that 
our group of like a Sparta cast to include Tamacast is not going to, Oh, a big yawn. That's not going to fit into, um, that helical space or inside that, um, inside that helix. Now the outer diameter of the helix with the side chains is as large as 10 to 12 angstroms. So those side chains are pointed outward. So from here to here, the end of those residues or the, the kind of, uh, perimeter of those residues is all told from here to here is 10 to 12 angstroms. Now what this does is this, sorry, this happens to fit very well into the major groove of double-stranded DNA. And we've already talked about one enzyme that kind of utilizes that, and that would be those restriction endonucleases. So I could imagine that you would have a alpha helix present on a restriction endonuclease. So it can kind of use that as a key to fit into that major groove, tell you which nucleotides are present and then cut or don't cut. Now, amino acids one and eight in that top down view where we were numbering them off, those align very well on top of each other. Um, and so that gives you kind of a perspective of one and four was like one was here and four was here, but based on the rotation of that helix, one is going to be here, four is here, and then eight is here. So those are like right stacked on top of each other. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind there with respect to that helical structure. Now, the, the sequence of the amino acids, despite the fact that those residues are pointed outwards, they do have an influence on helical stability. And that's something that I can comfortably say. I did mention that the residues of that alpha helix do not play a role in dictating the formation of that alpha helix. They do, however, have an influence on presence of hydrogen bonds. So it's those backbone hydrogen bonds that are going to stabilize the structure. But overall, secondary structures are going to indeed be influenced by amino acid sequence. So not all polypeptide sequences adopt an alpha helical structure. For instance, if you have a sequence that has an alanine or a leucine, those are highly likely, they are small hydrophobic residues, they are highly likely to form an alpha helix or be involved in the formation of an alpha helix. Proline, on the other hand, well, let's think about proline. I'm just gonna draw the backbone for any amino acid, N, C, C, Proline is kind of a, a stickler because it comes out here, here, and there. Oh man, it kind of limits the rotation and limits the, uh, it, it kind of limits what that polypeptide backbone can do. So it acts as a helix breaker. So if you have a proline, chances are you're not going to be involved in an alpha helix formation. Does that mean it's absolutely impossible? No, it doesn't, but it's just unlikely that it's going to happen. Um, and if you think back to which bond is that, well, it's not the peptide bond. That is instead the phi angle. This is a phi. I guess this is with the, the fancy script that Microsoft uses. Um, it kind of looks like a, a psi because they both look like a psi and they both look like a phi. Um, but anyway, that's something to keep straight. So N to C, that's your phi angle. Glycine acts as a helix breaker because that group is entirely too small. Now, it's kind of funny when you think about glycine versus alanine, you kind of group them together because they're both very simple amino acids. Well, glycine just went too far. Glycine is just a hydrogen. So compare that to alanine. Alanine is a methyl group. So it's a little bit larger. Um, attractive or repulsive force or interactions between side chains of three to four amino acids um, those will also influence um, the formation of an alpha helix. Now, what this right here is, this is data from a paper that they investigated basically the change in the change of free energy based on the introduction of an amino acid in a peptide that generally is going to form uh, an alpha helix. So they had an alanine in there and they mutated it to an alanine. And well, what they did was they saw no charge, but then as you change to different residues, you saw an increase in that change in free energy. So what this shows down here in the, the table is 
Change in change of free energy is the difference in the free energy change relative to that for alanine required for the amino acid residue to take up the alpha helical conformation. Larger numbers reflect greater difficulty taking up the alpha helical structure. Okay, so we're changing from an alanine to an alanine and you would expect no change. That makes sense. I'm going to put a smiley face by that because that makes sense. But then let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum. We already, sorry, we already talked about alanine being highly likely to forming a uh, secondary structure or an alpha helix. Proline, on the other hand, that's a breaker. And proline has a change in change of free energy of greater than four. If you look at all of these, we've got glycine with 4.6. Proline is greater than four. Um, valine, tryptophan, tyrosine, no one else really comes that close. So glycine and proline, based on this data set, were our residues that are most likely to um, cause an increase in energy and cause a basically a disruption of formation of that alpha helix.